You could say that it's the heart of all matter. A huge cosmic symphony. And that everything in life is vibration. Imagine yourself in a beautiful ballroom where you have two violins, both in tune with each other. If you play a note on the string of one violin, the string of the other one will vibrate at the same frequency, even though the two violins never touch. This is called sympathetic resonance, and we see it with many different instruments. But a similar kind of resonance happens between people. When two people are in tune with each other, we often say that they're on the same wavelength, or we say that there's social harmony. On the other hand, when they don't get along, we say that there's discord and disharmony. All of these ideas are related to vibration because, as the scholar Isaac Arama wrote, everything a person does resonates with the entire world and causes similar acts everywhere. Humans are like strings that vibrate when activated, and the world is like an instrument that resonates to those same vibrations. This implies that we're connected on a level much deeper than it seems on the surface. One of the leading thinkers in this area is the psychiatrist Dr. Bernard Beitman, who says that we have the ability to tap into what other people are experiencing, to feel what they feel without any physical contact. He calls this ability simulpathity. Simul meaning at the same time, and pathity, which means feeling or suffering. And so simulpathity happens when two people feel the same emotions at the same time, even when they're far apart, separated by huge distances. In his book, Meaningful Coincidences, Beitman tells a story that when he was 31 years old, standing in his kitchen, he was suddenly hit with the feeling that he was choking, like something was blocking his throat. What's strange is that he hadn't eaten anything, so there was nothing to cough up. For the next 15 minutes, this terrible feeling stayed with him, until just as mysteriously, it disappeared. The next day, his brother called to tell him that their father had died from choking, and yet he was 3,000 miles away in a completely different city. The timing of these events led him to believe that it couldn't have been a coincidence. When he dug further, he found that many people report similar experiences. More than 2,500 people responded to a survey saying that they occasionally felt the pain of a loved one from a distance, with no physical explanation for it. All of this suggests that we have the ability to connect with each other in ways that go far beyond our current scientific understanding. For me, one of the most powerful depictions of this comes from the film The Double Life of Veronique by Krzysztof Kieslowski. It's the story of two women whose lives are deeply connected in ways we can't explain. It's a glimpse into a mysterious world filled with synchronicity, emotion, and the hidden threads of meaning that tie us together. We'll look at what this movie can tell us about the hidden connections in your life, and there will be spoilers ahead. This is Veronica. She's a young Polish woman who loves music and loves to sing. Her voice is beautifully haunting. One day, she watches a choir practice and is so moved by the music, she decides to sing along. By accident, the music director overhears her singing and asks her to audition. She does and wins a big role in the choir. Filled with excitement, she heads home and passes through a town square, where a political protest grows louder by the day. It's an interesting contrast where we see her smiling while, just behind her, crowds of angry people are rallying against the government. When this movie came out in 1991, Poland was going through major political change, beginning its shift from Communist Party rule to more of an open Western democracy. As Veronica makes her way through the square, a man bumps into her, throwing her music folder onto the ground no one stops to help. She gathers herself as the streets become more chaotic with every step. But then something stops her. A bus surrounded by tourists taking photos of the spectacle around them. There's one tourist who captures Veronica's attention, a woman who looks like her exact double. But who is she? Veronica can only stand and watch as this mysterious woman gets on the bus, totally unaware that Veronica's watching her. She can't take her eyes away, and the bus drives off. It's a surreal scene, and it's the central mystery of this story. What is it that brings these two women together? What's the connection between them? Because they've never met each other, and yet all their lives, without knowing it, they somehow sensed that the other was out there in the world. The idea of having a double, of coming face to face with another version of yourself, is very old. The ancient Egyptians believed that our souls are made up of different parts, 
one of them being a tangible spirit double that has the same memories and emotions that we do. And in Germany, the word doppelganger literally means double walker, a person who somehow shares the same physical appearance, even though they're unrelated biologically. In some traditions, meeting your doppelganger was believed to be a bad omen, a sign that your life would soon come to an end. And there are hints that this is what will happen to Veronica. On the night of her concert, the conductor stands on stage, directing the music as she sings. It's a captivating but strange performance. The camera shifts and we begin to see things from her point of view. As the orchestra music swells, she suddenly grabs her chest in pain. She falls to the floor and the whole crowd goes silent. Without warning, the camera shifts again to a new point of view. Gliding over the audience, it's as if we're seeing Veronica's spirit pass over the theater as it leaves her body. Tragically, Veronica dies. At her funeral, we look upwards at the people standing above, as if we're with her in the grave. It's a visceral scene, and they toss dirt onto the coffin until at last. There's only darkness. But then, in an instant, we're transported to another part of the world. In the room of Veronica's double, the very same woman who was taking photos on the bus, we learn that she's a French woman named Veronique. Suddenly overwhelmed with a feeling of sadness she can't explain, she says, I don't know why, but it feels like I'm grieving. I feel so alone, as if someone suddenly disappeared from my life. It's here that we learn that these women share a deep connection that goes far beyond their physical appearance. It goes to the heart of what psychologist Carl Jung called synchronicity. Synchronicities are meaningful coincidences that happen when an inner state of the mind lines up with an event in the outside world. They're not connected by cause and effect, they're connected by meaning. In this case, Veronique's sudden feeling of grief is the inner state that lines up with the event of Veronica's sudden death. And there are all kinds of mysterious connections between them. Both of their mothers died when they were very young. Both of them were raised by their fathers. Both women have heart problems. The coincidences that tie them together are shown through a kind of visual poetry that's both hypnotic and enchanting. Jung says that what defines synchronicity is the sense of the numinous. It's an experience of the divine that lifts us outside of ourselves, inspiring wonder and awe, a sense that we're all connected in ways we can't see, hinting at deeper patterns of meaning and a single unified reality from which everything derives. It's what Jung called unis mundus, which is Latin for one world. After this experience, Veronique meets with an old man. We learn that Veronique is also a singer, and this man is her music director. She tells him that she's decided to quit. Why? I don't know, but I know that I have to, and I have to quit now. Her choice isn't based in logic or conscious reasoning. It comes from a place of deep intuition, and it will change the course of the rest of her life. In a scene that mirrors Veronica's walk through an angry street in Poland, Veronique smiles as she walks through a schoolyard filled with children laughing and playing. We learn that Veronique is a music teacher. In her classroom, she leads her students through a musical piece she's come to love. It happens to be the exact song that Veronica sang when she collapsed on stage. Later that day, a renowned puppeteer comes to put on a show for the school. With the lights dimmed, he slowly opens a wooden box and a ballerina emerges from it. It tells the story of a dancer who moves gracefully across the stage and takes a great leap into the air, but falls and breaks her leg. In agonizing pain, she collapses. An old woman comes and wraps her in a white sheet, but magically it changes into a cocoon. The ballerina rises, transformed into a butterfly. It's oddly similar to Veronica's story and it hints at the possibility that death isn't really the end that it's a kind of transformation, a way to transcend the physical world and move to a higher state of being. Veronique watches as the puppeteer packs up his things. They go their separate ways, but she's drawn to him. Through chance or fate, they meet again, and we learn that his name is Alexandra Fabre. He draws her attention to an old photo she has. Veronique tells him that she took it when she visited Poland, but only now she notices that one of the photos she took was of her double standing in the street. That can't be me, she says. She's wearing a different coat. This overwhelms her with emotion, a mix of astonishment and grief. Veronique then visits Alexandra's home, where he's making a new puppet that looks just like her. There's even a second one, lying lifelessly on the table. Why are there two of them? she asks. 
I handle them a lot when I perform. They get damaged easily. Alexandra tells her that he's also been writing a new book, and he reads part of it to her. November 23, 1966 was the most important day of their lives. That day, at three in the morning, they were born in two different cities, worlds apart. At two years old, one burned her hand on a stove. A few days later, the other one reached out to touch a stove, but pulled away just in time. And yet, she couldn't have known she was about to burn herself. It's an unsettling scene, and it's an example of what the French call mise en abîme, which literally means placement in abyss. In film and literary theory, mise en abîme is when one story is told within another story, often in a way that suggests a pattern that repeats over and over again. In the first level of the film, Alexandra's story of the two puppets directly mirrors the lives of Veronica and Veronique. The puppeteer symbolizes the forces of chance and fate that invisibly influence Veronique's choices. She can't see them, but like the strings on a marionette, she's connected to these forces in ways she can't explain. One level above that is the realization that Kieslowski himself is a kind of puppeteer. He's the filmmaker who directs the story and the way it unfolds for every one of the characters in the movie. Much like the puppet show that Alexandra gives at the school, Kieslowski brings the story to life through thousands of frames of moving images and sound, creating the illusion that everything we're seeing is real. And if we move one level above that, we can imagine ourselves living in a world where a higher consciousness operates in all of our lives, including Kieslowski's and every living being on Earth, an underlying unified reality that connects every living thing. Each level is a story within a story, and so the way this movie is put together is a lot like a fractal. Fractals are a type of pattern that repeat themselves over and over again in a way that's self-similar. This means that each part of the image looks like the overall whole. One of the most common examples of this is the branching pattern we see in trees. If you look at the overall shape of a tree, it has a Y shape, but each branch has even more of its own branches, which themselves look like smaller versions of the tree. Zoom in even further, and those branches have even smaller branches, and so on and so forth. This even applies to the leaves of the tree which have tiny veins that also have a similar branching pattern. Fractals are one of the most fundamental patterns in nature. We see them everywhere, all around us. The Polish mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot revolutionized this area using computer models to generate fractal patterns derived from what's called the Mandelbrot set. No matter how far you zoom in on any part of the image, you'll see the same recurring pattern over and over again, infinitely. This has led many people to ask, what if our universe is a fractal? Our universe is made up of billions of galaxies. If you zoomed into the Milky Way, you'd find billions of stars that light up the sky. If you zoomed into our solar system, you'd find the Earth, populated by about 8 billion people. If you zoomed into one of those people, you'd find a brain filled with billions of neurons. If you look deep inside one of those neurons, you'd find countless atoms separated by empty space. And if you zoomed in far enough, might we find a whole other universe with the same repeating patterns over and over again? To me, Kieslowski is telling us the story of these two women in a way that hints at this infinite fractal pattern. The very first scene of the movie takes us back to Poland in 1968, where we see Veronica as a little girl. Her mother holds her upside down as she points out the first star in the sky on Christmas Eve. Millions of other stars appear around it, each one completely unique, each an entire world on its own. Meanwhile, in France, Veronique's mother shows her a leaf and points out the tiny veins and the patterns they make. Soon, all the trees will have leaves, she says. While Veronica is connected to the celestial world of the stars, Veronique is tied to the physical world of nature. Even though they might seem separate, we see hints that their lives are joined by patterns that mirror themselves both in the outside world and in the inner world of their own experience. All of this blurs any clear boundary between them. The psychologist Terry Marks Tarlow tells us that fractal patterns are related to synchronicity in a very important way. If the universe is fractal and we are self-similar parts of the whole, then is it really that surprising that our inner states would line up with the outside world in such meaningful ways. 
In other words, synchronicity is what happens when the fractals of our external reality merge with the fractals of our inner reality. What's more, she says that perhaps we intuitively understand fractals because that's how intuition works. At its core, intuition is taking one slice of experience and seeing that it's part of an overall pattern of a much larger whole, and then understanding it right away without having to think about it consciously. Even history is fractal. The closer you look, the more complicated, yet always repeating patterns. Some of the most intuitive people seem to have a gift for seeing through chaos and finding the underlying patterns underneath. Ask yourself, what patterns do you see when you look at your life? Does the same problem keep coming up over and over again? Does the same sort of relationship keep repeating itself in your life? Often the way we make the smallest choices is mirrored in the way we make bigger life-changing choices. Understanding why a pattern keeps happening can be the key to resolving it. It's at this level of intuition that Veronique uses to approach her own life. There's a scene where she gets a mysterious letter with no return address and nothing inside of it except for an old piece of string. She decides to throw it out, but later a glowing light dances across her room. At first it seems like it's coming from outside, but actually it doesn't seem to be coming from anywhere. This light leads her to another piece of string which reminds her of the string she tossed away, and so she takes it out of the trash as if to reclaim a part of herself she's left behind. Strings are a huge recurring symbol in this film, from the string we see in Veronica's music folder, to the string Veronique puts on top of her cardiogram to mirror the vibrations of her heartbeat, and the unseen strings of a marionette. Veronique understands that these are all part of a meaningful pattern that's guiding her. She's tied to them. She's open to the signs and trusts her intuition to uncover what they mean. It's fitting then that Veronique's story ends by reflecting how it began, in what might be the most numinous scene in the film, she leaves Alexandra and sits in a car as she reaches out to touch a tree. Somehow, in a way that's completely unexplained, her father feels her presence, even though they're nowhere near each other. Another powerful example of simulpathity. But the tree Veronique touches is important for another reason. The tree of life is a powerful and ancient symbol that appears in many spiritual traditions around the world. It expresses the axiom, as above, so below, because trees have roots that form branching fractal patterns that bury themselves deep into the earth. But its branches also reach upwards to the heavens and the world of the divine, the seen and the unseen parts of who we are. As above, so below is also the insight that the macrocosm or the larger universe as a whole corresponds with the microcosm, the human being within it. And so if we know something about one level of reality, then we can access knowledge about the other levels. And it's this understanding that Verani connects with in the end. For me, this is a film about tapping into that higher, more powerful part of who you are, finding connection in a world that seems more and more fragmented every day. And yet, you remain part of a cosmic dance that's unfolding in every moment, a divine conduit with the ability to channel higher forces that link you to the past, present, and future, like the branches of a tree, the veins on a leaf, the glimmer of countless stars that light up the sky when we think we're alone. Kieslowski said that different people in different parts of the world can be thinking the same thoughts at the same time. If there's anything worth doing, it's in touching on the things that link us and not those that divide us. If culture is capable of anything, then it's in finding that which unites us all. Because it doesn't matter who you are or who I am. If your toothaches or mine, it's the same pain. The word love has the same meaning for everyone, and we all love in the same way. Feelings are what link us together. What are your thoughts on simulpathity? Have you ever felt an unexplained connection to someone from far away? Let me know. I would absolutely love it if you pressed the like button and left a comment with the tree emoji. As always, thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next one.